18 different projects um, to respond to public space and uh, interrogate what that means for them. Uh, Tanya is one of the artists we've been working with over the last couple of months <coughs> and yeah, we, it's been great to work with her on this particular project and see where it's gone so far. So, Tanya, thank you. Thanks for having me and thank you guys for coming down. Um, I, I was going to show a quick clip of the program itself, but maybe I'll, I'll the um, Uncommon Places program, maybe I'll show that at the end um, of this session because I'm just conscious of that time. And also, I'll be looking at my paper quite a bit because I have a tendency to rile off because I want to say everything all at once. So. <laughs> okay, so today we'll be um, just, this is kind of what we'll be covering. Um, so a quick introduction, what it means to frame something. Um, we're going to look at borders as a colonial construct and what are some of the characteristics that might make sort of decolonial interventions specifically um, in relation to the arts. So this year's um, theme was instructions. Um, and that's, you know, all the artists sort of dealt with various different um, interpretations of what instructions mean and may mean. Um, my reading of instructions and what ultimately informed this intervention um, is that there's inherent sort of power um, in the, and there's a power dynamic in instructions and in these contract, in these sort of um, constructs and the framing of things. So that's what we're going to touch on um, today. So the inherent sort of power dynamics, even in the seemingly neutral, in quotation marks, phrasing. Um, so. so placed um, outside of one's home, sort of welcome mats sort of elicit this idea of um, warm welcome. Um, so, warm, sort of polite, friendly greetings. Um, so the key to this was the juxtaposition. You know, the, the assumption of a welcome mat, the function of the welcome mat is to a welcome. So playing with that assumption by slapping on an unwelcome, very o like overtly unwelcome phrase um, on, the, on the mat itself. Um, so in so doing, hoping to sort of raise questions um, about sort of what makes the welcoming, who makes the welcoming, and therefore sort of I, like questions around ownership of national space, especially in regards to Australia's um, history. This was the artist statement. Um, so again, touching on you know the protectionism, monocultural ideas, militaristic sort of paranoia around sort of border control. Um, colonial fantasies, historical amnesia, the toxic discourse that we use, um, and humanizing policies. So again, it's the sort of the, the contradictions that happen sort of between anthems and our actions, um, and the paradox of that set in this country. Um, you know, the, the sense of who who has ownership to national space on on a land that's never been ceded. Uh, so again, like touching on the paradoxes that happen in our everyday discourse, um, touching on the paradox of the the rhetoric and sort of the the idea of logic of what has become normal, what has become considered a natural law, when really it's it's one construct of history, it's one narrative that has um, sort of occupied a universal stance by excluding everything else. So these mats, um, these, these two are placed at third draw down, which is in Pran. And oh, there go. Um, that's the old parliament house. Um, this one was quite, quite interesting. Um, as you can see, there already exists like Welcome mats, right in the entrance there, in the security guard standing there. Um, this one did involve interaction, like the security guard was like, oh, you know, what are you doing? What is this? And 
And then he ended up calling like his manager, and the manager had to call somebody else. And then by the end of it, two police guys came up to me and were like, what is this? Um, and you know, I, I tried to leave the mat like right at the front, um, but then they were like, oh, it's occupational health and safety. And then like there were all these sort of, you know, the, the, the PR talk. Um, but it was interesting because he was kind of like, oh, what is this? And I, and I noticed that there was like, there was a value perception based to being associated to the Fringe Festival. Does that make sense? Because I can be like, oh, no, it's not just me as an individual person yeah. coming here, you know, to do this and to you know, disrupt. It's, this is part of the French festival, it's commission art piece, and da, 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 da. Um, And they're like, oh, oh, okay, okay. And then, like, as I'm trying to sort of have a conversation, at one point he stops and he's like, is this, is this a protest? <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, I was like, oh, no, it's, it's, it's an artistic intervention. <laughs> and, <laughs> <laughs> because we know that as soon as the word protest comes into their like their, their discourse, it's like code orange or something, you know. You know that there's a way to react to that automatically, even without thinking, even without actually asking you what's going on. So that was that was quite interesting. Um, this was at in front of the Department of Immigration and Border Control, and I expected like before doing this, I called up two or three um, artist activist friends and asked them for advice and recommendations around how to deal with security and the possibility of the police becoming involved. Um, so I did a lot of research before this to know kind of what my rights were in a situation like this, if something were to happen. And the irony is like, I, I put it there and we were kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> and, and everything just went was as usual. People walking in and out were either on the phone or on the papers and then like there was no kind of there was no obvious security in, in like a person or standing there. But the omnipresence of security was all around us. Like we would just be like, oh, just... Mm -hmm. And then even because the leader came in and did a photo shoot um, for the local um, Point Cook paper. Even like the journalist and the photographer were like, um, I need to check the light, but I, I don't want my camera to be confiscated, so I'm just going to go Ksh -ksh. and Ksh -ksh. and like, this is how we were working the entire time. And then at one point, the, the, the main journalist was like, no, no, let me check what's, what's going on. And she went in, like right into the department, she walked around, she came back and she's like, there's just one guy standing in the corner and he's like right in the corner on a computer. He hasn't even noticed we're here. And that's kind of like, the power of, it's what, well, I think maybe Foucault said something like this, um, where almost the idea of it is even like, triply more threatening than actually someone having had that standing there like the security guard at the, the previous um, site that I was at. And a couple of times I did stop people and were like, oh, did you, did you kind of, you know what? And they're like, oh, yeah, I just assumed it was a, it was a map. It was a, like, and that was interesting to me as well. So I was like, you know, it, it told me a lot about the mat, its its functionality, what's it saying, how is it saying, and how visible it is. So I'd like to play with that in the future. Like I was thinking, I was talking to the videographer. Maybe it's like a red carpet, or maybe there's a performance person standing there, like something to highlight <laughs> and to sort of uh, um, play with the habitus of your normality of life. So. Uh, and, of course, there's one here as well. Um, it, was it was upstairs, right? Yeah, it's upstairs. Um, and I just, I love the contrast there with the quote that you can read. Um, and there's also an artist statement next to it too. And this is part of the, the, the exhibition called Getting In. Which is, yeah. So, um, so I guess, my, my argument today is that the discourse around the refugee issue is sort of, is quite individualized um, and kind of takes on the, the premise of increase, increase in intake or increase citizenship pathways um, without necessarily questioning the notion of the nation state itself. Um, the nation state as an ongoing sort of existential violence, right? Um, there's a really, really beautiful quote um, by Alessandra Matusuma and Mike Davis, um, and they say, they wrote this, all borders, 
are acts of state <coughs> violence inscribed in landscape. A regime of practices, institutions, discourse, and systems that define border imperialism. They also serve to justify the logic of settler um, thinking and um, set the settler logic. Um, again, that logic being, this is reasonable, this is natural law, this is universal, this is everything else is in relation to. Um, so I also sort of, with this piece, wanted to question how this logic even becomes part of the so-called pro-refugee movements. How it's, how it's easy to fall into the same sort of logic, almost in a superficial way. Um, so as you guys might have noticed, it's become quite prevalent internationally, also nationally, um, the, the sort of, to say, welcome refugees, right? That welcome refugees movement. Um, again, looking at, um, the maps hope to question the framing of this welcoming. And at this point, I want to stipulate that today's talk is not about uh, the nuances of what it is to be like pro or what it is to be anti. Like, what are those sort of arguments? That there's another space to have that discussion. So it's not about the arguments of pro and con kind of thing. It's about the conversational frames and the discursive frames in which that conversation happens. So these conversations, I argue, happen already in an existing sort of representational field. So the question is, how did that representational field come to be? And how is that um, restricting our idea of nationalism and identity? What gets included, excluded in that process? So, um, because when, when, when the conversation is restricted to that particular representational field, you exclude also other ways of being and other possibilities. Um, and so that's kind of why I keep playing with the juxtaposition. That's why I, I keep highlighting that as a really important aspect. Um, the, the, to challenge the existing, the existing contradictions that, that happen in this discourse. Just to clarify a little bit more, what I mean by the representational field is that there, has, there is one way of understanding the world that has become the dominant way of understanding the world. So that would be modernity. And very, we are very comfortable as a society to talk about the advancement of modernity and it's fantastic because of this and look, this is the train and all those ideas of what makes a sort of modern civil society. But um, as, as the decolonial theorist Walter Mignola says that in that line of rhetoric, there is the undercurrent. There is the darker side, he describes it, of modernity, which is colonialism, coloniality, which is something that we are not so comfortable talking about the exploitation of, um, of of resources for modernity to have happened and to continue to happen. Um, so he describes it as modernity slash coloniality. So what he argues in that slash is that they're not uh, one cannot exist without the other. So every time he refers to modernity, it's slash coloniality to make it clear in his discourse that this this is happening this is happening in the undercurrents and it is you can it is everywhere around us but it requires a sort of I guess a sensitivity or a change in habitus to shift that discourse um, and so again it's what is this and how has it come to be this representational field and how has it comes to be supported by other things like media, blah, 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 etc. Institutions in general. Um, so, uh, yeah, let me go to the next. That. Um, that is painted on, on at the VCA cafeteria. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Refugee support or way of life. Again, I'm talking about the power of framing and who sits in that position. So questions that come up from this talk, uh, from this, this phrasing, 
Uh, who has the imperial power to do the welcoming? <clears throat> Uh, what are the historical forces of this modernity sort of slash coloniality discourse that we just had um, to designate this power to certain groups? Um, what is the relationship between the welcomer and the welcoming? Um, and what is that welcoming in relation to indigenous practice slash, slash nation state practices? Um, another example of sort of uh, welcoming sort of artistic interventions is um, the Real Australians Say Welcome um, oh, yeah, yeah. movement, yeah. So that, that piece has um, come up in conversations, personal and also professional conversations. And in one particular moment, um, one of these interactions, the response was, hey, don't, don't, like, don't incorporate me in your genocidal welcoming. And that was really, I've never sort of seen it that way before. It's just the, um, you know, referring to the frontier walls, you know, even, and supporting, like, uh, this sort of welcoming idea, supporting the imperial sort of development of positionality and who gets to do that sort of, that create, name, and define, who gets to, you know, various different aspects of, of humanity, who is more human than the other, right? Um, Robbie Thorpe, who's an Indigenous leader, has this really beautiful quote, and he's like, the Australian government has no legitimate right to grant or refuse entry to anyone in this country, let alone lock up people fleeing war and persecution. So I think that highlights it quite, quite well. And the other thing I want to point out in this phrasing is who takes up the central authoritative point in that phrasing? And how does everything else stem from that relation? How do things come into existence because of this particular point of authority that has granted itself that point of authority, really? Um, one thing that I, I, I feel this quote does accurately describe <laughs> is, um, is the, I, I guess, the neoliberal demands of, of intake of people. That's, that's pretty much all it describes. Um, and this is uh, um, this was flagged to me after after this, this particular intervention. I don't know if these were produced. That's not, we're not here to question where, how many, or what if, or you know. Um, I, I I'm bringing this up to highlight how I feel this is different to an intervention like this. Um, I one questions the contradictions of modernity through juxtaposition, and one is. I feel one reading of one sort of one um, D welcome narrative, which is um, so it differs in that sort of blanket one dimensional welcome call upon the the individual um, humanity of a person, um, rather than questioning some more of the institutional historical implications by which something like this is happening. So. Again, it's the, so the, the welcome mat with the unwelcome phrase, placing it in front of institutions. Um, in, in these sort of decisions to make this piece, these little multiple decisions, I uh, hope, pushes this beyond the sort of the one dimensional reading of um, the welcome narratives that are happening um, currently. Uh, so, a, a way to sort of question the discursive frameworks that we spoke about earlier. Um, and I think something like this differentiates the possibility of something being self-determining, helping um, sort of a, an, an autonomous sort of self-actualization step as opposed to kind of um, speak as, as you are supposed to within this particular category, category type um, projects and, and discourses. <coughs> um, Notice the time. Um, I want to touch on really, really quickly, hopefully very quickly, I'll try to talk fast. If I talk too fast, let me know. <laughs> Borders as, as colonial constructs. And I'll, I'll try to be quite brief. Um, so the welcome mat as in where does one space end? Where does one space begin? And kind of how these sort of almost arbitrary decisions have 
you know, come to be made enforced um, and how they implicate all of us in that process. Um, so uh, separating the idea of Australia, the idea of Australia from the geographical cartographic idea of Australia, because this, this, this is not the way the world necessarily existed. Um, these divisions were made because of colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, things did not exist necessarily because of this point, the central point of, of authority. These other things didn't exist until this central point was like, I'm going to go explore this, or I'm going to, you know, that's when history sort of, um, I argue, that's how modernity, the coloniality matrix of power um, came to be. So, uh, so the imperial colonial foundation of what therefore informs our modern idea of, you know, nationalism. Um, so, again, touching on that, before, before colonialism, um, like, indigenous Australians would go, oh yeah, I, I'm an indigenous, I'm an indigenous Australian. They didn't conceptualise themselves as that before colonialism, nor did, um, nor did, you know, Latin Americans say, oh, we're Latin Americans. Like, these terms came through this idea and this expansion of Western modernity um, as a way to sort of define and order the world. Um, and in ordering the world, there's, there's a system associated to that, um, which gets rolled out. So the irony of not existing until the ignorance of that central point meets me. Isn't that, yeah. Um, history is one narrative, which is why I really like that particular quote from that blog. Um, let's see. So what, yeah. <laughs> so what I argue is shifting the core of the discourse and the framing of the discourse shifts the possible conversations that can happen. Um, and and highlights also the inherent idea of, of what is that has happened historically and uh, politically. Um, and this is a really great example. This is a recent banner that was posted on um, the Rise uh, Facebook page. Um, so something like this is decolonial thinking, is a decolonial intervention in itself because Instead of, start, instead of starting your thinking and your, your discourse and your argument at the universal idea of, of um, human beings, uh, decolonial thinking and interventions sort of start at how this came to be, which is colonialism, European Renaissance, Enlightenment, um, and how these processes came to define humanity, other forms of humanity, but also um, uh, knowledge makers, informants, uh, enunciators, and enunciated. So shifting the, the, this particular call changes the questions and, and yet yeah, highlights the contradictions. And I want to give you another, um, I think it's really important to, to bring in examples happening around the world. Um, so I want to touch on this really interesting example, um, the data think tank. <laughs> This particular photo is from the United States, but this data think tank has been traveling the, the West um, and Europe and uh, hopefully Australia soon. Um, so, developing the first world. So, this is um, an ongoing art intervention since 2006. It's a participatory art piece. Um, so, the data think tank is a group of experts. Um, and these experts look at the problems of the Western world and um, the first world. They have a lot of problems and they, they take on these um, problems because people sit over there like, oh, this is our problem in the West here. And so it's very interactive. And they sit and they think on the problems of the first world and they offer solutions to the, to the first world. Um, and in so doing, developing the first world. It's a brilliant, brilliant piece. Um, and these, these think tanks have been set up um, these, these sort of uh, HQ, I guess, of think tanks have been established in Cuba, in Ghana, Iran, Mexico, El Salvador. Yeah, and it's and it's been touring the world. So, um, it, it, again, it's the, the changing the changing of who holds that authoritative central point um, to do the solution making. Uh, basically, um, it's not 
what can I know, what ought I know, what may I hope, and what is a human being, which is kind of more the, the European sort of philosophical way of approaching um, something. Um, um, it's, you know, th these approaches are very like, I, what should I know, what ought I know, what I don't know, it's very, um, it's, it's, it's a conversational frame that doesn't necessarily inherently have a reflexive element to it. Um, it's an objectivity um, without parenthesis, which is a, a phrase used by Walter Mignolo as well. An objectivity which is objectivity and states itself as the ultimate truth, whereas objectivity through parenthesis is its one objectivity amongst many objectivities and many truths. Think I think so. <laughs> um, so instead, what he suggests are these questions to think about as constructing like decolonial thinking. And I also at this point want to argue that there's there's no blueprint um, to to a decolonial thinking or interventions. Um, one's act of resistance is another one's act of compliance. So it's also about taking on the understanding of your positionality in society. What are your sociogenetic beings that have been placed among you, and how can you play with that through your interventions? Sociogenetic beings being. You are this particular person in this space, you need to be this particular person in this space, all socially, politically constructed. Um, so, take the unwelcome mat, for example. So, if this particular mat was placed in front of, say, rice, that would have a completely different meaning. Or if that particular mat had just a welcome phrase placed somewhere else, completely different meaning. So, what makes a decolonial intervention are these kind of type of questions of how do you play with the contradictions and the juxtaposition in relation to your positionality in society. So, mm, 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 yeah, and that kind of brings us, but no, that's later. Um, so in playing, <laughs> I'm so bad at PowerPoints. Um, in playing with these, these contradictions, again, I want to stipulate you're playing with the sense of neutrality, the sense of, um, natural, so-called, universal <coughs> law. And I have a really, really interesting uh, other piece that I want to show you. Um, this person also performed at the Mixed Reads Conference in Chicago 2013, but this, po this was posted in 2014. And it's a mock lecture um, by Fred, and his name is, uh, surname is Sahasi. He's the arts director of Poultry Magazine in Chicago. Um, this is his this is his art intervention piece, and this is his performance to question the idea of a central, neutral point of being. You know how when 